Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, I think it's evening now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session of the um, Ada Africa Africana Journal Club. Uh, this is a club we have formed as researchers based in Africa, also outside Africa, who come together to encourage each other in research, to mentor each other through peer mentoring support, and to also celebrate each other. So one of the activities we have in the club is to run our webinars. And these webinar topics are informed by topics that members have suggested. And that's what we, we really make sure that our approaches are really led by what people want to know and learn. And today we are honored to have Geoffrey Otieno with us. He's going to take us through a topic that a number of you have really struggled with especially as you begin to conceptualize your research and has been a nightmare for most as your proposal keeps coming back. But I think today we will have great discussions that allow us to unpack what are research designs, at what place do they have in your research paper, and how can you make sure you are selecting a design that really aligns the type of questions and objectives you want to address. So my name is Aurelia Monene. I'm the founder of Ada Africa and also an, a researcher in gender uh, and also very enthusiastic about research mentoring. I'm going to introduce Geoffrey so that you know him and then he will take over the day for me. So Geoffrey Otieno is an international strategy and business transformation consultant at Enreal Limited, which is a company he founded in 20, 2007 in Nairobi. Is a business coach at Stanford University, USA. Is a business mentor at Santa Clara University Miller Center. Geoffrey is also an innovative thinker and he has worked with a wealth of companies in our continent. One of which is Proxil, East Africa as a country director. He has been a director of Nokia Corporation. He has also worked with Microsoft, Eastman Kodak Corporation across many countries in the world. And he has innovated, he has innovated two digital apps that are present in various countries in Africa. And uh, there's an article which he has been celebrated as an entrepreneur of the year. Um, and he, I think one of the things I saw Geoffrey is that you're really shifting the narrative from African entrepreneurs or the African space being seen as very poor, but really showing that we have entrepreneurial spirit here, people are working hard. And I think one of the apps I saw you have is called Chango to support in fundraising, but you can talk about it a bit more. So what has Geoffrey studied? He has a degree in Commerce Business Administration from UN. He also has an MBA from Strathmore Business School, a certificate in French from Allianz. Bonsoir, Monsieur. I know a bit of French, Dogo too, and he's currently doing his PhD in innovative strategy focus at, um, at uh, Strathmore University. And he, he has also written, he's very good with strategic planning. So if you have an organization where you're thinking through your strategy, he's the man to go to. And he has worked for over 600 organizations all over Africa, USID, Christian Aid, name them, he's been there. He served also in many boards uh, and uh, serving countries like South Africa, Tanzania, Cameroon, Nigeria. He has grown over 300 businesses across four continents. So this is, these are really people who are making the mark in Africa. And he has founded an SME think tank in 2020 to support SMEs as they navigate the COVID pandemic effect. I welcome you, Geoffrey. Journey with us, and we are here to learn with you, to share with you, and to grow together. Karibu sana. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Aurelia, for that uh, pretty elaborate introduction. Um, I'll switch on my camera for a minute. Uh, then for bandwidth purposes, I'll shut it down again. And good evening, everyone. Um, just by a show, uh, if you can just type on the chat, 
where you are in your research journey. And secondly, what type of research was it? Was it a quantitative one? Was it a qualitative or was it a mixed method one? Just type on the chat where you are in your research journey and the type of research that you're carrying out, whether it's mixed method, quantitative or qualitative. I'll give about a minute and then we can take it up from there. So if everyone can just type where they are in their research journey, I'll appreciate. Yeah, I see Salome, you are at a proposal level and you're doing a mixed method research. Christine, I've seen yours, you've just submitted your dissertation. Congratulations. Concept level, qualitative research, mixed methods, quantitative. Caroline Muraguri, quantitative, right? Anybody else? Isaiah, I've seen your proposal stage. Um, working to publish my research paper from my PhD. That's Lydia, quantitative. That's 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 an interesting stage to be at. Um, Alan is deciding what to study. Open to use any relevant method. Great. Okay, so we can see we, we are all at very different uh, stages of our research journey. Zuta, I see you at uh, thesis stage, Dr. Lovedays, topic definition, research proposal, and you are intending to do a mixed method research. Fantastic. We are all at very different stages. And so what I'm going to share is something that will possibly help you pick one or two things based on the type of research that you're carrying out. And it is my hope that uh, it will be beneficial to at least one person in the room, who, if not everyone, so that we can uh, all learn from the presentation. So I'll try and share my screen. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Great. So let's let's try and see if we can understand what research design design is. Um, the sensitivities. I saw a question around what are the threats to research design, and uh, that we'll talk about the sensitivities around it, and then look at a few uh, types of designs and see which problem. Uh, is best suited for what kind of uh, design. And if we get a chance, we'll, we'll get to discuss uh, a bit more. We'll also want to know what are the questions for the various types of designs. And just to put it into perspective, there's a nice picture I found in uh, one of the books that kind of explains what research design is and where it is in your journey. The book itself is research methods, uh, business research methods. Um, I have the older edition, the seventh edition. So you can see uh, that's how it looks like for those of you who'd like to uh, look for it. I think there's a newer version now. And right on the cover, it has that diagram that uh, begins to show you what research design is all about. Um, and then it goes on to explain the various uh, approaches that you have. This is why I was asking that whole question, where are you, what type are you doing? What kind of approach do you have for your research? Is it a quantitative one? Is it a qualitative or is it a mixed method? Because based on that also, we will see how those designs uh, change or interact. I'll put that there for now as a, definition just to set the tone so that we are all on the same page on what we are trying to discuss today. But you're basically talking of a master plan of how you're going to collect and analyze the needed information. That's basically what you're trying to do when you're looking at your research design. And that's why in the diagram that I was showing you earlier, you find 
you're in between the proposal and the results uh, piece. So why is it important? You need to do a good research. You need to pass your exam or defense or you need to plan, have that plan such that whatever you come out with will be credible and more so you will reduce the amount of time uh, you, you take to gather the data or get the results that you want and as a result reducing the cost of your research. If you do not have a good research design, there are instances where people have had to go back to the field to start all over again. And that can be a very, very, very expensive venture uh, when, you, when you go and defend your dissertation and then you have to go back and collect more data or even start all over again. Uh, that can be very, very painful. So you, you, you do a design because you want to get some information, background information. Uh, you're developing your hypotheses or questions. Um, you want to measure something, you want to test a hypothesis, or you want to test the relationships. And one thing to watch out for is that when you're doing your research, especially those who a few had talked about uh, being at uh, data collection stages, those who are in the data collection stages, you'll realize that uh, the research process is iterative in nature. Apologies for the birds. I have a few trees in my compound. So now is when they're coming back to their nests. So that whole noise is about birds uh, uh, coming back to their homes. Uh, but we can. I hope we can carry on without uh, too much noise from the birds. Now, when you do that, when, when you, you have an iterative process, several mistakes can happen. And that's why planning that whole research process is very, very important. And in some cases, uh, people end up using multiple research designs. I know this is one of the questions that was asked and I'll talk about it uh, as I go along in the, in the discussion today. So what are the principles? We've talked about it being a plan. You, you, your plan basically tells us how the study will be conducted, what type of data that will be collected, and how will you obtain this data? What do you want uh, to obtain? So the design itself, as we said, it's just a plan of action for meeting the objectives you had set in your chapter one. So this is the linkage. There was a question around how is it linked to the objectives? What you set in your chapter one, your research questions and objectives, will determine what kind of design will help you get to a, a answer those questions or meet those specific objectives. So it's very key to look at your objectives and research question and see, is it aligned to what you're trying, the plan you have, is it aligned to helping you answer the research question or is it not? And each design, as we'll see as I go along, um, has its own application, uh, depending on your problem, of course, and objectives as we've, uh, we've talked about. You need to consider maximizing. Uh, there's somebody who needs to be muted. Glorious Karake, if you can mute. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you need to maximize the reliability and validity uh, while minimizing research errors. And in, in a few slides, uh, I'll explain what that means. There was a question around what are the threats to research design? That's a question that basically looks at two areas, reliability of your research and the validity of the research. If we look at reliability, you're basically trying to see, is the research consistent, stable, and dependable? Can we replicate? If somebody else ran the same research in the same area you've done it, 
with the same parameters, everything being equal, would they get exactly the same what you've gotten? And then the validity is all about uh, accuracy of measure. So these are the two areas that if errors occur, then the reliability of the research is in question. It cannot be replicated or the data cannot be depended upon and hence a uh, need for either repeat job or starting something totally different. So when you're doing your research design, um, you need to consider those two. Aurelia, if you can help. Uh, yeah, me. kindly. Vincent, please, please mute. Okay, somebody. I'm not able to mute you, Vincent. Please mute yourself. Uh, good people, okay. let's all stay muted so that we can consistently, we can follow the flow of the presentation and we will have you. a question and answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. So what are the characteristics of a research design? First, you look at your setting. And the setting can be, for those who are in the medical field, there was a doctor who was talking about the medical field. You may have lab studies where you're in a controlled environment and uh, you're doing your research in a controlled environment. But majority of the people in the room who are in business studies, you, you most likely will end up doing field studies where you're in the natural settings of what you're trying to study. And secondly, the timing, how much time do you have? If it's a master's program like what Christine is doing, she has two years. So she will want something that she can get the data and analyze the data within the time frame of that study. If it's a paid research where there's an organization sponsoring you to do a longitudinal study, a study that can take several years, then you have more time to look at what you're collecting. You have more time to decide what kind of uh, designs will work best for you at what stages of the research. And, and so that, that also tends to uh, look, uh, change or alter the design that you select. And then the subjects to be included, you have to look at what's your sample size or what's the population, what's the data collection method, how do you want to communicate the findings? These all have a bearing on the research design that you'll end up uh, selecting. I'll talk about quantitative. I'll start off with quantitative designs, and then I'll go into qualitative designs. And then at the final end, I'll go into mixed method designs because there's so many uh, types of uh, research designs for each of those. And I'll discuss as we go along. So maybe you can pick and see if you're doing quantitative, this is what you want to do. If you're doing qualitative, this is what you need to do. And then if you're doing mixed method, this is what you want to do. I'm glad there are quite a number of people who are doing mixed method. So we'll have some fun when we're discussing the mixed method design. And there's a book I'll recommend that uh, helps a lot in clarifying um, mixed method research design. It makes it, it's written very simply and uh, clarifies everything so that makes uh, life a little bit easier. And of course, if you're doing quantitative or qualitative, you can still use the same book because it clarifies both ends. So when you look at exploratory uh, design, the researcher doesn't know much about what they're trying to study. It's a new phenomenon or a new challenge and they're trying to discover uh, what are the issues around that new uh, challenge or whatever is coming up. Um, in the problem that they formulated. So they want to discover, and that's why it's called exploratory. They are exploring uh, something that they want to understand. They want to gain some information. They want to define something. They want to clarify uh, something, or they want to establish the research priority of what they are studying. I've put a diagram there that shows you exploratory research methods. Uh, you have secondary data analysis. Uh, this is just interpreting what's existing. Uh, you have experience surveys, which is gathering from those uh, 
who are assumed to be knowledgeable on the issues. And uh, this can be in two formats where you have a key informat informant or you have a lead user survey to acquire, um, for example, like lead user survey to acquire information from lead users of a new technology, for instance. I'll put that because my study is on lead user innovation where I had to look at um, where do I find these lead users and uh, uh, they give me the information that I need for my study. Um, so when I'm explaining this, it will be heavily leaning on business studies. And for those who are in the medical field, uh, bear with me. I'll be leaning heavily towards the business studies, which is what uh, I've done uh, for my uh, dissertation. Then you have case analysis, you have focus groups. Uh, case analysis, you review available information about a situation. And then that situation has some similarities with what the research problem that you have. And focus groups is all about just getting people into small groups and then guided by a moderator to derive information from them uh, in a way that it's not um, structured in uh, such that uh, they, they can only pick certain things. No, you, you want to get everything from uh, gain information in an unstructured, spontaneous way. They just discuss and you listen in, and in some cases uh, record and uh, where they allow, and uh, then you, you analyze what comes out of it. Now, when you look at the second one, which is descriptive research designs, you can see there are several types of descriptive designs. You have exploratory, descriptive, all those that are listed there on that list. Uh, including again case study and feasibility studies for those who are in, uh, in business. And just a quick one in terms of the definitions. The descriptive one, just like the name says, you're trying to describe answers to questions and it is best used when you wish to study something that has a larger population and the study sample is representative. Uh, of what you're trying to study. You can have cross-sectional, we talked about this earlier, or longitudinal studies. Again, this depends on how much time you have. In the Kenyan setting, for the Kenyan uh, students, especially master's or PhD, you, if you're a master's student, you have two years to finish your studies. If you're PhD, um, you have four to seven years to finish your study. And so, most of the students end up, in fact, a large majority end up taking cross-sectional studies because then you can uh, easily obtain the, the data within the time frame of your study. Um, and the, the cross-sectional that we talked about, it's actually a snapshot at a point in time. And so you're, you're recording uh, data at a given point in time. I give you my own example where my data collection was uh, for a period of about uh, nine months, uh, the whole of uh, last year, just collecting data and trying to look at it and analyzing the data, collecting data as I go along. Um, and it took about nine months. Um, longitudinal studies, this can be over time. And like we said, uh, it can take several years uh, to finish the, the, the particular studies. And then we have others like continuous panels where you just keep on gathering uh, information and asking questions from panels and getting to measure what are you getting? What is varying uh, from one panel to the next? Uh, as you can see, the discontinuous one also uh, you vary the questions from one panel measurement to the next, uh, not, not necessarily the same set of questions, but these are just types of descriptive research studies. And like I said, there are many, and depending on what your research question and your research objectives are, you will decide which one to choose. So then you have the third one, which is the causal research design. This is where as the name suggests, you're looking at the relationship 
what affects what basically so you you you're trying to understand in under what conditions that for example x if x happens then y happens um the medical researchers uh, know this quite a bit uh, they they probably use this uh, uh, more than any other group and uh, they use experiments where you have either a controlled uh, environment with one experiment group and another and so uh, that's how the causal uh, research uh, looks at then you have uh, i've talked about experiments this is just where you're manipulating uh, certain variables to then see what happens while also controlling the effects of other variables to see what happens when they are controlled so that then you get the difference and probably the difference is what you record as your uh, findings and some people describe it as experimental design uh, which is why i put that slide there uh, to help you understand that even when you're looking at that change in the dependent variable um, you can have that run in an experimental environment or experimental design as well now these are just symbols of experimental design for instance uh, for the scientists in the room this will look very familiar where you're looking at uh, what do you want to measure what do you want to manipulate uh, what do you want to uh, randomly assign to some subject or group and then what's the effect uh, that comes out or what what happens to the dependent variable that you had identified um, once you do all the things that you've written that you want to do again uh, these are just part of the symbols i'll move a little bit faster uh, based on the time but uh, if there are any questions uh, i'll stop at some point and ask uh, if there are any questions and so Again, this talks about the control groups and the experimental groups, which we've discussed uh, just a few minutes earlier, where you have a control group. And then now let's move on to qualitative research design and see what's the difference with what we've just discussed in terms of quantitative. Quantitative side, you're basically gathering data that you're analyzing, and in most cases, mathematical models, or you're analyzing using statistics, and and so you you're you're looking at uh, figures and numbers, and looking at how much, how many uh, things, questions like those. When you come to qualitative, it's a little bit more subjective. And so the types of research designs for qualitative are also many, and they are they vary in their usage. And the difference between this and the quantitative side is that qualitative is subjective. It's what your respondents or what your subject will will tell you based on that particular moment that you've asked that question. And so you can get varying results. Uh, one period from another, one day from another, or uh, subjects with similar characteristics, but you get different uh, results from just uh, discussing with them. So the first one you saw there was ethnography, which many people wonder what it is. I can see I'm getting a warning that the bandwidth, the network is low. Let me kill the video here, then I can, yeah. So. And I've defined ethnography to try and make it simple, where they, they come from the word ethnos and graphian, where ethnos just looks at people and graphian is writing. So you're basically writing about people and you focus on a group of people or a group of subjects. Your aim here is to describe the nature of those being studied. So anybody who's doing an ethnography will understand that your aim is just to describe what's being studied. This is a diagram I borrowed from a gentleman called Jagdish Sambad that just explains 
the steps of ethnographic research. And uh, we are going to make this available uh, at the end of this presentation. I, I believe Aurelia will share with everybody um, so that you see the, the, the steps of uh, an ethnographic uh, research. You can see that he's clearly uh, explained how you move from step to step until you get to the final point, whether you're developing a theory or you're looking at the results that you want from the qualitative uh, research. The second one is phenomenology, which uh, just looks at achieving a deeper understanding of an activity or a phenomenon. Uh, and this one, it requires a lot of rigor for you to be able to get uh, the research accurately. It, it, it does not, it, it just looks at the lived experience. What, what we are calling, imagine you studying, uh, let me see, if I take an example, you're studying about how a particular manager in a company uh, makes decisions when it comes to the production of a particular product. And so you, you, you probably will shadow that manager for a period of time, uh, observing and uh, recording and discussing and and you're, you're studying that phenomenon of that production when that manager is in that environment. Then you have the grounded theory. This is an inductive technique where the, the theory developed has its roots in the data collected during the same research. And this theory, this particular type of qualitative research states that uh, meanings are shaped by dealing with others. So you first collect the data, then you derive, you, uh, the, you develop the theory from the data that you've collected uh, through the qualitative uh, method. You have historical research, which is just looking at uh, data relating to the past and test it. Uh, to try and see how it can explain uh, the present. If you're lost, we are still talking about qualitative research uh, designs. Then you have case studies. Uh, this is just exploration we had talked about, and uh, it can be multiple cases over time, or it can be a case uh, very popular uh, for business students who want to show how two different organizations deal with certain elements of management. It's very, very popular in terms of doing case studies uh, or even comparing uh, companies in different countries, how they deal with situations that are similar. Then there's, an, there's one that uh, is called feminist research, which uh, I also just happened to have learned about from uh, the notes I got from the book. This is all around creating social change and respondents participate in the research process. Then you have the action research where you're, you're doing research and working on solving a problem at the same time. Uh, an example of this, Aurelia talked about uh, the, the app that uh, uh, developed called Chango. I was actually researching on um, how communities come together to fundraise while trying to solve the problem at the same time, and hence the birth of that particular app. And I'm still doing research to study what are the behaviors of uh, the users in terms of uh, what, what would they want to make it better. So research is continuous. Uh, sometimes you do it not just for um, passing exams or getting a, a degree, but sometimes you do it for your own business. There was somebody who said they're in consulting as well. And when you're a consultant, you'll do a lot of research, uh, especially if you're developing strategy for an organization. There'll be a lot of um, research that you'll carry out to try and understand how can you then move this organization that you have responsibility to develop their strategy from where they are to where they want to go. And in there, you, you'll find your, your design uh, 
uh, is different. Uh, in in most cases, it will be a mixed method because you'll you'll conduct interviews and get qualitative uh, answers to certain things. But at the same time, you'll also do quantitative uh, surveys uh, from time to time to try and gather something or or the other about either competition or you want to understand uh, the products or you want to understand um, the financials and that will guide you in that particular aspect. So then I go to mixed method design and we've looked at quantitative and we've seen uh, I've just talked about the three research designs in quantitative. Then we've looked at qualitative. And then I've talked about almost seven different types. And now we look at when you do a mixed method research design. And I promised you that when I get to this stage, I'll talk about a book that uh, helped a lot in uh, helping me design my uh, develop the design for my research. There's a book by Professor Labanairo. La Professor Labanairo is the, is the vice chancellor of uh, Daystar University. And he's written a book by the uh, title, The Nature and Design of Mixed Methods Research. If you're doing a mixed methods study, I highly recommend you get a copy of that book. It simplifies mixed methods research design. Very, very, breaks it down into very basic uh, elements that help you avoid the minefields that most mixed method researchers come across. So what, what are the types of designs? He talks about three types of designs. It talks about convergent design, where you, you separately collect quantitative data and then you collect qualitative data and then you merge the results of the analysis of the two areas. But these things are happening simultaneously. So you, you're collecting data qualitative, you're collecting data quantitatively, you're analyzing, analyzing, and then you merge uh, the results uh, of both analyses. Then the second one, he talks about exploratory sequential design. This is where the nature of it is that it's exploratory. You're trying to find out something. You're trying to discover something. So you start by doing the qualitative part first in your research. And based on the findings of the qualitative uh, data collection, you then go into a quantitative phase. And let me, let me try and explain this uh, a little bit more. So let's say you want to find out, uh, I don't know what example I can pick. You want to find out uh, something to do with the uh, management decision-making, um in uh, a particular environment you'll first of all talk to a few managers who fit the the profile of the management you're looking for and based on what they tell you you can then go ahead and try and discover how how far is this particular problem spread for instance the problem you're trying to study uh, uh, how how much does it affect the industry? And then you go into a quantitative. After the qualitative, talking to the managers, they'll give you um, some data. You'll analyze it. You'll formulate a quantitative tool. And then now you go into collecting quantitative data to try and see uh, what does it tell you based on what you learned um, in the qualitative phase. So in the exploratory sequential design, the quantitative goes to justify or confirm what was discover, uh, discovered in the qualitative phase or not. It just helps to bring clarity to what was discovered in the qualitative phase. The other one is explanatory. Remember the first one is exploratory. 
which is qualitative, then quantitative. The, this other one now is explanatory sequential design. You're trying to explain something and you start with a quantitative data. You analyze it. And based on what you find, you then want to go deeper. This happens when you want to explain something. So you want to go a little bit deeper and discover why is it, why is that problem the way it is? So that you can then answer your research question. So that then you can you can see whether you're you're meeting the research objectives you have. And so you 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 start off first by collecting data, quantitative data, you analyze it. And based on the analysis that you find, you develop from it, you develop a qualitative tool. Um, and that helps you now dig deeper into some of the findings that you found in the quantitative phase. And that is how you end up uh, getting that as an explanatory sequential design. So just so that we you 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 don't get confused. Remember exploratory sequential design, you're exploring. So you're trying to find out something about a problem and you do not know how wide the problem is or how far or in terms of. So you start first of all with a qualitative, you, you, you do the qualitative piece and that helps you then develop the quantitative tool. While in explanatory, you're trying to explain something. And so you start with a quantitative and see how far the problem is uh, spread. And then you go into the qualitative to try and get a deeper understanding of how the problem is. I'll give you my own example. Uh, I was trying to understand the lead user innovators, people who innovate, what affects them in the way they innovate and what processes do they use? And thirdly, how does the regulatory environment affect what they innovate? And you can see from the third uh, question, I first had to understand from the innovators themselves what the regulatory environment, um, how the regulatory environment plays a role in the innovation. And based on what I discovered, I, I discovered, I got some very interesting findings. Um, it came out very clearly that yes, the regulators affect them. And so I, I wanted to understand exactly how. So I had to interview another set of innovators picked from the same uh, 400 uh, people I talked to earlier to dive deeper and understand. And then added another layer where I now needed to do qualitative interviews with the regulators themselves to also understand the other side uh, of the story to, to understand why does the regulator uh, do the things uh, the way they do and uh, ex find out if they are even aware that those things affect the way people innovate and the way people carry out their technological advancements uh, in this particular country. Uh, that brought in some very good insights, which uh, I'm glad to say that uh, it ended up being a very good conference paper that I presented uh, in August this year at the Academy of Management in Seattle, um, where it was accepted as a conference paper and then published in the conference proceedings. Any questions? Let me just check the chat and see if I can. I see in the exploratory sequential, what if the results of the quant disagree with the results of the qual? Interesting. Christine, that's a very interesting question. And that's the nature of research. It does happen that you find what you're getting in the qual is different from what you're getting in the quant. 
Uh, and there are, there are various uh, reasons for that. You might find your qualitative um, study, probably you, you, you did with a few people and they gave you opinions rather than, you, you did not exhaust your qualitative interviews. You know, when you're doing the quali qualitative interviews in the exploratory sequential, you must reach a point, a saturation point where now the kind of answers you're getting are beginning to be the same over and over. I'll, uh, I'll give you an example of, uh, I talked about doing my qualitative interviews. And when I was interviewing the lead users, I had to interview 34 lead users. And in every of those interviews, I was getting something new. But at the 35th, I started getting similar things. Then I went all the way 36th, same thing. I'm getting now a saturation point where no new information is coming up. Then I knew I had everything uh, that I needed to learn. It's 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 the same thing. You must make sure the qualitative piece, you've reached the saturation point. Otherwise, it can uh, you can get to that, what you're describing, where you find your quant disagree with the qual, and uh, then you have to now decide, do I go back and start again and see what exactly is happening? And sometimes uh, the findings are very, very interesting. Uh, Charles, Charles Solo, thank you very much. Mixed Research Methods by Professor Labanairo. Yes, it's available at Textbook Center and also available at Daystar itself. You can walk into Daystar if you're close by and uh, they will be able to give you a copy. Uh, I can't remember how much it was costing, but it was roughly around a thousand or a thousand five hundred shillings. And it's not a big book. It's it's just about uh, 140 pages, but very rich information in terms of carrying out mixed method research. How do you treat sampling when approaching mis mixed method research for qual quant? Interesting question from Vincent. Now that's that's a totally different topic because sampling will depend on so many things. What's what's the population we're trying to sample from, for instance? And if you're looking at the population, if it's a very large population, then there are various sampling methodologies that you can also uh, deploy uh, based on the the particular study that you're conducting. Um, and so you you need to look at what's what's the size of the population, what's what's the meaningful size that you you'd be able to uh, get what you want to get from the particular uh, qualitative or quantitative approach. In some cases, the population is unknown, Vincent, and so. When you get to the quantitative piece, the sampling methodology again will, will change. Uh, giving you an example, in, in the case of uh, lead user innovators, it was very difficult to know who's a lead user innovator and who is not. And so the sampling methodology that I adopted was uh, using uh, Taro Yamani's uh, formula, which then helps you calculate the ideal sample that you should use that will give you a representative sample of the larger population. Um, then we have Steve Ayuya, he's talking about presence. Maybe if you can explain what you were talking about detecting presence, then maybe we can be able to assist. Or if there's someone in the room, remember this discussion as Aurelia said, we are here to help one another as well. So. Um, I, I will not claim to be a repository of uh, all the information concerning research design. And so if there's someone who understands where Steve is coming from, please feel free to jump in and help in answering that he's, he's only detecting presence. And so he would like to understand. Maybe I can expound myself on the mm -hmm. same. Yeah, I was looking at uh, mosquitoes. I'm a uh, MSc Entomology, Applied Entomology. Mm -hmm. So I was specifically looking at uh, detecting the presence of uh, malaria parasite in uh, Anopheles costani. This is in Mumias East. So I don't know, after 
collecting my data, I have analyzed, I, I discovered there were some parasites in some of the uh, mosquitoes of interest. So I don't know, is this research quantitative, qualitative, or is it mixed? Thank you. From, from, from what you've explained, um, that you were detecting the, the, the parasites, whether they exist or not, and what I would, I would have liked to understand, were you counting the, the number of cases, the, 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 the number of cases where you detected the parasite? If you were, then you were doing a quantitative one. But if you were questioning the subjects on something, then you were doing a qualitative one. But if you were doing both, then it would be mixed. Just from the explanation, the short explanation you've given. Yeah, actually, uh, initially, I just wanted to detect to see if, uh, okay, initially, we realized that we had these mosquitoes in the uh, area of study. So I just wanted to find out if the mosquitoes could be bearing the sporozoids, the malaria sporozoids, or not. But then, uh, we, and yes, we realized they were there. So the initial study, we found out that there were only uh, two out of about 188 uh, mosquitoes. After taking the paper for publication, they said that this one was too low for the same. So I had to get back to the field and collect more of the mosquitoes and I realized they still had it. So I don't know if I, where I could categorize the same because my initial uh, uh, study was just to detect if the Anopheles costani could be having the malaria sporozoids, which I got from the first collection, but then it was uh, uh, taken to be so low. Yeah, and, and you can see then you were doing a quantitative despite it being low. And, and that's one of the challenges of research. Um, you, can, you can study a particular issue and you find that the data you are expecting to find or the data that you find is too low to provide meaningful analysis or meaningful results. And, and so it forces you to, to go back to the field and uh, try and gather more data. Uh, in your case, you, you are studying something very specific. And so you had to go back again and uh, probably look at uh, how many more mosquitoes have the parasites, uh, which, which is still quantitative. Okay, thank you. Ah, I see Mary Odongo is asking, what is the best way to frame your research questions or objective to speak to a mixed methods research design? Now, uh, that takes you back, Mary, to your chapter one of your research. You start with a problem. What's your problem? What's, what's the problem you're trying to look into, uh, possibly with the intentions of getting a solution? And based on that problem, you will then define the question, research question or questions, and the research objectives. Now, when you have questions such as how many, how much, uh, you, you're then going towards uh, quantitative. When you have questions that require uh, explanations, they are open-ended, then you're going towards qualitative. In some cases, for you to do a mixed method research design, you, you will find you have questions that provoke the need for uh, in-depth as well as uh, quantitative. That's when you, you then know that this is definitely mixed method uh, research uh, design. You want to find out something, how, how does it occur in uh, Kenya, a part of Kenya? How many times does it occur in a part of Kenya? And how does it affect um, the population that is there, for instance? Or, or what, are the, what are the implications of whatever you're finding out in that particular area of Kenya? If we take uh, Vincent's example. And, and so you, you'll end up finding that those two you, you then have uh, a mixed method approach. But all these things are linked. So the key thing is to be very, very clear with your problem. Your research problem has to be so clear 
that you can see the link on why you have those research questions and objectives. That's, that's where to start. The research problem in your chapter one has to be absolutely clear. Otherwise, uh, you might find yourself going back and forth quite a number of times. And there was also another question around what's the link of the research design and the literature review? That was a very interesting question that I got earlier on. And the simple answer is that when you're doing your literature review, basically literature review, you're trying to find out what has been done in this area that I'm trying to study? Who else has done what? And what did they find? What are the contradictions? What, where do they converge? All the people who studied, where do they converge? What are the contradictions? Where are the gaps? These gaps that you find go back to justifying why your study is important. And when you find those gaps, and that's why doing a thorough literature review is very important because then it goes to, when, when somebody reads your literature review, they'll be in a position to see that what you've taken goes back, you can highlight the gaps, but it goes back to justify why that problem needs to be studied. So this literature review goes back to support why your problem is important. And as a result, it starts explaining why those research objectives should be looked into or why the research questions should be answered. And now when you do that, it helps in creating the research design that will best answer these questions. I think that's, that's the easiest way of uh, trying to uh, explain it uh, so that you see that uh, yes, the literature review also plays a role because what you find from previous studies still goes to justify, or you can find what you thought was a problem. Somebody else had already studied it when you're doing your literature review. And as a result, you, you end up starting afresh because that has already been done. And in some cases it was just done uh, a few months before you started studying the same thing and probably in the same environment. And so you find there's no need for that particular research. But in, in best case scenario, which we all pray for is that uh, you find in the literature gaps that strongly support uh, the problem you're trying to understand or the problem you're trying to study uh, so that the, the literature itself also starts uh, helping you in terms of justifying your, your research. Um, very, very strongly. Uh, I saw a question from, there was a hand that was up at some point. Um, my screen, unless I stop sharing, I can't see whose hand is up and uh, who's, who's. So really, is, if you can help it me. It is mine. May I okay. go on? Yes, please go on. Okay, um, thank you for your uh, very coherent and articulated actually presentation. Um, regarding the exploratory sequential design and the explanatory sequential design, exploratory, mm -hmm. you, uh, you recommend that we start collecting qualitative data, then we proceed and collect the quantitative and the yes. other one vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, well, how do you recommend the presentation of the data in the analysis section? Should it follow that order or we go with the traditional actually method of presenting the quantitative, interpreting it, then bringing qualitative later on? How, what is the best approach? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that question. Now, I have to be careful how I answer that one because every university has their own. First of all, look at your university uh, rules and regulation with regard to uh, research, how they want the research presented. Some universities are very specific and they give you, they prescribe a table of contents where they insist follow this one, whether, whether it was exploratory or explanatory, just use this. So please find out first uh, how your university wants it. But if it's a, if it's a research that you're doing and You've, you've explained that you're doing an exploratory uh, sequential design, the readers of the research will automatically expect to find qualitative first 
so that it justifies the quantitative. So even in the results, they look at the qualitative. And remember, the quantitative goes to uh, further explain or, or explore what you found out in the qualitative. So they'll expect it in that format. In the reverse, where you're doing explanatory sequential uh, design, the readers will expect to see quantitative. And so, and here's an interesting thing. Uh, when you're doing quantitative uh, and you're doing qualitative, the chapters that follow, uh, also the naming matters. So you'll find for somebody who's doing explanatory sequential design, they will start with quantitative. So you'll find their chapter four will, will read res, uh, research results or something like that. While the chapter five will read research findings. So there's a difference. The results will look at quantitative results. The findings are qualitative findings. So you'll see a lot of that um, in research. And when, when somebody who's in the field understands, when they see results, they know those are quantitative. And when they see findings, they'll know those are qualitative, where an explanatory um, sequential design is uh, deployed. I, I hope I've uh, answered your question. Uh, you did very well. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let me see uh, if there's any other. No, a... no other. Mm. No other. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Aurelia and the IDA team for this opportunity to share with my fellow researchers. Um, in case there are any other questions, please feel free to send them to Aurelia and I'll be more than happy to uh, guide where possible and share my own research experience, uh, including publications and uh, uh, having done the explanatory sequential research design in my own study. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Back okay, to you. Already. Thank you, Geoffrey. Thank you so much. We actually have another hour left. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know how we can use it, but I was thinking if people have, um, since you were here, to be here up to eight, and we can take a shorter time, can we try and figure out, especially those who have not figured out your design, you type in the question and then you kind of say, what design are you thinking this should be? And we can all support you in terms of um, identifying your design because we really want you to live here knowing almost very clearly which design are you going to apply for your study if that's the area you're struggling with. Do we accept to do that or do, would we like to leave? But uh, we have quite some good time. So yeah. if, if maybe you're doing this research question, you can say, this is a question I'm looking at. I'm thinking this is the design. Is it true? Is it not? Or something like that. Do we do that? Yes, please. Yes, Mary, your hand is up. Yes, Mary or Dongo, your hand is up. I can even create um 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 yes. hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um Geoffrey, thank you very much for that presentation. Um I've just started my PhD journey. I'm working on my proposal and um it's been it's 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 been quite something, but I'm I'm learning a lot. I, I wanted to ask you a question, not about my research design. I'm using a mixed, I plan to use a mixed methods um, um, design, but I wanted to ask you about um, um, philosophy and your mm -hmm. philosophical approach when it came to, to either choosing your design or linking, you know, linking all the various um, pieces of your research together um, in terms of um, epistemology and ontology. Would you be able to talk a little bit about that? Okay. Thank you very much for that question. 
just to demystify it, when we talk about the philosophies and you're talking about epistemology, ontology, or axiology, um, epistem is knowledge. And so epistemology, you're looking at the knowledge, the base of the knowledge. And when you talk about ontology, you're talking about the reality in the eyes of the researcher. And so you're looking at what's what's the reality in existence in the eyes of the researcher. So what you, you will be asked in your, and congratulations on joining the PhD program. One of the questions you'll be probably asked in your proposal defense is what is your ontological stance? And you need to understand why they're asking you, basically they're they are, they are trying to find out what's your view of reality in terms of the research you're trying to study. And, and then axiology just looks at what's basically your belief system as a researcher and uh, what's, what's your, it, it's to help you avoid uh, the biases that exist in research. All these philosophies highlight, one thing they do is they highlight uh, potential biases and therefore goes back to what we talked about in terms of reliability and uh, validity. So you can see all these things are interconnected. And depending on your ontological stance, you, you can... And there's there's a there's a nice I forget the name of the book, but Cresswell also talks about uh, the philosophies quite a bit. But there's a better book that uh, simplifies it. Yeah, Saunders and Thornhill. If you can get, let me see. I have I have an older edition. I'm just looking at my library now. Aurelia knows I love research, so I do a lot of research. Uh, let me switch on my camera, then I can show you a book that will help you. Um, this is the book, uh, Saunders and Thornhill. This is a fifth ed edition. This is how it looks like. And the title is Research Methods for Business Students. It has a research onion on, um, I'm trying to remember the page. It has a research onion that helps you understand how the philosophies uh, integrate with your choice. And you you can if you can get because it's it's a little bit more elaborate than the way I'm putting it. If you can get a copy, or if you don't have a copy, I, I don't mind. If you're in Nairobi, I don't mind sharing my copy with you so long as I get it back. Um, and uh, yes, if you've been using Cresswell, then you have the best in terms of uh, research. Cresswell also explains the research onion, a little bit more complex. But for someone who's starting your PhD. I would recommend you also uh, read this uh, Mark Saunders and Thornhill because he, they really, really, really simplify uh, how the philosophies are related uh, with the entire research, in, including uh, what you're trying to find out now. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, and Aurelia has just typed in, please share your research question uh, or research objective, then we can see. Or if you want to uh, share your screen and show us, especially those who are at proposal stage, you're about to go and defend your, your proposal. This is the opportunity to use these few minutes to try and gather feedback from the plenary. Do not, do not fear, it will help you um, formulate a good proposal that then helps you uh, go through your defense effortlessly. There's nothing as, as bad as going for a defense and then you're sent back to square one to start uh, writing the proposal all over, all over again. Yes, I think um, it's great to use this opportunity if you're really struggling because your research design as um, Geoffrey said, you, did, you choose it based on the question. And I have seen sometimes when you're reviewing papers, someone is talking about, they want to see the impact of, uh, maybe they want to see the impact of a particular project and what it had in the lives of people. But the design they choose cannot answer an impact question. 
And so when you present that in your proposal defense, you will be told it does not align. So it's very important to make sure that the question and the objectives are really aligned. Can this, can this design actually help me understand this question that I'm asking? And, and that's where the mismatch comes. And then you see you, you, are, you go back and forth a lot with the lecturer because of that misalignment. So if someone would like to share their screen or just talk about, I'm thinking of doing this, I'm thinking of this can be my research area. This is what I want to ask, what design should I use? Because that, if you get that right, I think you will really quite uh, sail through because then you will focus on that design, what it demands, following it slowly by slowly, making sure there's validity, reliability, if it was qualitative, making sure you're doing good sampling. And so it's a very important match that has to be made quite early. So we would love to hear some reflections. You can even stop recording if you feel you'll be, it will be on YouTube. You can stop recording because this is a discussion session. We finished the presentation part. Yeah, so I think anyone the recording is what is intimidating them. So maybe if you can. Uh... Okay. So <laughs> recording has been stopped, and you will all hear. <laughs>